First and foremost, I would like to use the opportunity to welcome our distinguished guests here this morning, um, Courtney Martin, um, David Scott, Michael Dash, Ellen Gallagher, Sonia Boyce, um, Isaac Julian, uh, Alison Thompson, and Mark Nash. Um, it's really a great pleasure to have all of you here um, this uh, throughout the day, and I'm very sure that we're going to learn a lot and that this conversation uh, will become broader and deeper uh, throughout the day. And two people who originally were supposed to be um, here this morning, unfortunately, um, for one reason or the other, can't be here. Uh, we just received a message this morning that Steve McQueen, who is supposed to be um, engaged in a conversation between Isaac Julian and myself, uh, couldn't make it. He's uh, very ill. And um, so, but nevertheless, we're going to still be presenting Steve's film, Ashes. Uh, there's a special um, edition that is made specifically for the conference that will, you know, it's usually 10 minutes, but it's now 20 minutes. So it's made a, a special edition, and of course, that will be presented in tandem uh, with Isaac Julian's uh, equally epic reimagining of the Caribbean called Paradise of Meros. It was a collaboration between Isaac and, um, and Derek Walcott in 2002, and that was presented in Castle in 2002 um, for the uh, Documenta 11. And so for the first panel, we're going to have uh, Michael Dash and David Scott present, moderated by Mark Nash, so he wouldn't have Courtney Martin. The second panel will be, again, to keep it about artists. It will be Courtney Martin and Isaac Julian, for which I'll moderate, and our final panel for the day uh, will be um, two uh, very uh, important and distinguished artist, um, Ellen Gallagher, who many of you know here uh, through our exhibition that we co-organized with the Tate Modern um, several years ago. And we're very happy to welcome Ellen back again. And Sonia, um, again, welcome back. So that's a bit of housekeeping. So please um, help me in welcoming all our speakers, and I will get off the stage. Thank you so much. Mark. Thank you, Akri. My job, my role is as a moderator, so I'm going to make a few very moderate observations and introduce <laughs> the first speaker, um, David Scott. Um, David will present either from here or from the table. Then I'll introduce uh, Michael Dash, and then we'll have a question and answer session, so, um, and I hope you all have questions to put to both speakers as well as the various points that Okwi raised in his very eloquent introduction. Um, this session focuses on, as Okwi said, intellectuals formed by and in the Caribbean, that is to say if we include Guiana in the Caribbean, which is, which is maybe questionable. Artists and intellectuals who are also formed by the transition between the colonial and post-colonial political order. I think that's a very important um, element of both Frank Bowling, but also both Stuart and uh, Edouard Bisson's formation. They were a generation that were born in the colonial period, but they saw the transition to the post to the post-colonial. They were all involved in exploring connections between the Caribbean and the rest of the world from great power colonialism, UK and France, as I mentioned, to the neo-colonialism of the Cold War. And we should remember that the Cold War was also fought out in the Caribbean, in Haiti, in Cuba, in Grenada, for example. 
And then, of course, after 89, this is followed by the dominance of the United States in much of the Caribbean region. Dominance economically, dominance ideologically. If you want to phone the Caribbean, you have to put dial a one like you're phoning the United States. It's all part of that. Those, but, I mean, it is amazing to think of these artists and intellectuals who are formed in this period of multiple transitions and who were, I wouldn't like to say the beneficiaries, but in some way they were the beneficiaries of the established colonial education system as well as the movements for independence and liberation. So that, for, as Stuart talks very eloquently in his uh, first part of his biography, he became a West Indian when he came to London, when he met um, all the figures from the Caribbean who had also migrated to London. Nowadays, it's much more difficult for a, a younger Caribbean person to come to the UK. France is a, a different um, story. Stuart Hall and Edouard Nisson didn't live to see the local nationalisms which elected Trump and other leaders these, in these last couple of years, but their work is still very appropriate to the present time of post-imperial post decline. And many of the themes which Hall and Glisson explore can be traced in the work of Frank Bowling himself, as Ockwe has demonstrated both in this talk, but also his amazing catalog essay. So I do recommend the catalog. Um, I can't recommend it too highly. So my connection to these debates and discussions goes way back. Um, Ockwe and I first met, in fact, through the carnival in Notting Hill, which also features in one of Isaac's works, Territories. Isaac and myself had, were shared our research on our film on France Fanon with, with Ockwe, Fanon being another one of the key Caribbean intellectuals with a similar formation to Glisson. And just as an aside, um, our film on France Fanon Black Skin White Mask is finally now available on, on DVD. London is also a Caribbean city, and Isaac's graduation work, as I've mentioned, from St. Martin's territories introduced many of us to an artistic dialogue, both with the Caribbean and with the wider and deeper engagement with the political and cultural issues of slavery and the Black, Black Atlantic. And these were debates taken up in the UK by the work of Stuart Hall, his partner Catherine Hall, Paul Gilroy, and so on. So my, as I say, my introduction to the Caribbean was in and through the, the London Caribbean and then in 2002, I was privileged to work with Ocqui on in organizing Documentary 11, and in particular, the platform in St. Lucia, where um, I tried unsuccessfully to seduce Monsieur Glisson to come and attend our conference. Um, he was very preoccupied with various other projects. We didn't go into some of the... Sorry? Yeah, his excuse was he had, he had fever, but there was a certain tension between himself and Derek Walker. Um, Derek, all right, I'll tell the story now. <laughs> no, you, you don't know. Yeah, no, it's okay. Um, um, Derek had, Edward had kind of foolishly said to a reporter that he should have gotten the Nobel Prize rather than Derek Walcott. And this was published in an Air France magazine. And then um, when Derek was traveling Air France, he read the magazine. <laughs> and my, my job actually to persuade them both to come to Documenta was to go to a poetry conference in Berlin and they were sitting at diagonal opposite ends of the room with their own circles. Edouard with uh, Sylvie and um, Derek with uh, Sigrid, and I shuttled between the two, so it's diplo shuttle diplomacy. But anyway, enough of these genealogical historical reflections. Um, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, David Scott. Um, David is currently professor and chair of anthropology at Columbia University and president of Small Axe Inc. Small Axe is um, a very important magazine focusing on Caribbean literature and cultural studies, I would say. Um, I'm going to quote um, a little bio biographic note from David. His, 
My work, especially since Refashioning Futures in 99 and Conscripts of Modernity 2004, has been concerned with the reconceptualization of the way we think the story of the colonial past for the post-colonial present. This has involved a variety of kinds of inquiry, taking the Caribbean as my principal field of engagement, in tradition and generations, dialogue and criticism, self-determination and sovereignty, and so on. I'm, I don't mean, David, you're going to hear from David. I don't mean to go into too much detail. He's, he's recently completed a book called Stuart Hall's Voice, which I have a copy of and I will wave at a, at a suitable point. So um, it's a very beautiful uh, reflection on what is the title, the Stuart's Voice. Um, but he, David will explain more about that. Um, and he's currently working on a biography of Stuart Hall, as well as a study of reparations for <coughs> the injustices of New World slavery. Okay, so I think that's enough introduction, if that's okay, David. And um, I'm going to sit back down and come back for the second. Thank you very much, Mark, for that introduction and for the advertisement. <laughs> Um, and thank you very much, Opri, for inviting me to this, to this occasion, and uh, Andrea for putting up with the backing and forthing and trying to work out flight times and plane tickets, and for you all for coming here. It's a, it's a very great pleasure for me, and a very great pleasure for me to be speaking here in the context of, um, of this exhibition on Frank Bowling's work under the, under the, the very resonant uh, title, The Sea is History. This, the, the, the figure of the sea for all of us Caribbean intellectuals is, is omnipresent. In, in some sense, Derek Walcott, in that poem of the, 19, of the late 1970s, which is um, my era, so to speak, um, sums up a, a, a sensibility that is shared by generations of Caribbean intellectuals. And as um, you know, as uh, Okui intimated in, the, in his introductory remarks, speaking about people like Bowling, uh, Glisson, uh, Stewart, about whom I'm going to speak in a moment, this is a Caribbean generation, all of them born in the late 1920s, early 1930s, who are um, experimenting with form in, in a very profound way. All of them are experimenting with the question of the modern and of being modern uh, in a variety of different, in a variety of different ways and in, in intersecting ways. One can't listen to um, Frank Bowling there and not think of Aubrey Williams, his compatriot, for example. And Bowling was at school with very important Jamaican artists of the same generation. Um, I'm thinking of Barrington Watson in particular. Anyway, I made up a title for Andrea, who was insisting on a title. And the title is drawn from yet another Caribbean intellectual of this generation, um, Kamal Brathwaite, uh, who speaks of an archaeology of ourselves. But the, the title, I think, for the, my presentation will be a sense of displacement. It, um, I'm going to talk about Stuart. And I'm not going to talk about that book. I, I'm going to talk from the beginnings of trying to think uh, a biography, the impossibility in some sense of thinking a biography of Stuart Hall. These are emphatically notes, no more. There are four of them. They are, I think, connected more or less, but they may not exactly add up to an overall coherent thesis, not yet, anyway. Certainly they do not constitute a systematic <coughs> argument. Rather, and in the spirit of Stuart Hall's characteristic way of formulating what he had to say, they are meant to be tentative and provisional and exploratory, really only points for further elaboration and clarification. And yet, nevertheless, they are not meant to be entirely aimless. They seek in some form to circle around the general theme of what I'm going to call Stuart's art of living, his self-constitution of a thinking, acting life, 
his ingeniously paradoxical project of self-creation, of living a self-examining life, becoming who he partly already was. In short, his archaeology of himself. If Stuart seemed always to live within shouting distance of a range of solidarities and commitments, multiple ways of being with various others, he was nevertheless an unmistakably singular individual, inimitable, his own unrepeatable voice and present. I think of this singular individuality as involving intimations of an ethical passion. And I think of the pivot of this passion, its animating ethos, as having been Stuart's vivid sense of displacement. There is a lot to say about the way Stuart practiced an art of living as displacement, in particular how it gave point and inflection to his style, how it was embodied in the soul of his dispositions, how it salted, again this idea of the sea, how it salted the restlessness of his spirit, how it conditioned his reflective consciousness, and I will try to say some of it here. My whole point though, to give it to you at, at the outset and at one go, will be to suggest that although displacement would become, so to speak, his hermeneutic handle, the covering name for a conceptual family of technical preoccupation, preoccupations, including his special uses of the idea of identity and of diaspora, it was more than that. It was a primary form of experience, the name of a habitus. He knew it before he could spell it to use a locution he was fond of. In any case, here are the notes, note one. Not surprisingly, as I think about his biography, one of my central preoccupations is how to understand Stuart Hall in relation to Jamaica. By this I mean how to think the senses in which Jamaica, his formative experience of Jamaica between 1932 and 1951, the cultural historical Jamaica, in some relevant sense, he embodied, helped to shape the distinctive intellectual he became or how might we generatively connect Stuart Hall to a Jamaican specificity? How might thinking with and through Jamaica help us to understand something about the intellectual that Stuart made of himself? These aren't straightforwardly approachable questions, but as some of you know, the sense or senses in which he was a Jamaican wasn't unimportant to Stuart himself. Or anyway, it seemed to become more and more important to him, especially in his later, more retiring years, perhaps in part as growing older, growing old, altered the temporal frame in which the present could be connected to the experience of a past and to the expectation of a future. Stuart resisted autobiography, resisted telling the authoritative story of himself, how he became Stuart Hall, how Stuart Hall became him. Memoir wasn't his metier, he was primarily an essayist. But having resisted for so long, he oddly found himself in the middle of one. One that he couldn't quite finish, yet couldn't quite let go of. I've talked about this before and won't repeat it here, the paradox of writing in the last conjuncture the ways in which the memoir was an uncannily difficult writing form for him, in as much as it demanded a certain relation to time and especially to finitude, and therefore a temporal relation to the self that couldn't quite be settled once and for all through a memorial retrospective panoptic, seeing it all at the end of, of a day that would not yield another one. But there remained the persisting question, who anyway was Stuart Hall? And how had this Stuart Hall come to occupy so central a place in the intellectual history of the 20th century? Why did so many people from so many different domains of intellectual and artistic life, from different generations and ethnicities, converge on 
or depart from Stuart Hall. It wasn't self-evident, not least to Stuart Hall himself. More than this, it made for an ironic and unsettling form of subject-object experience. As Stuart suggested himself on more than one occasion, it was as though he would, from time to time, turn a corner and, unexpectedly, find himself fleetingly face-to-face -face with the figure of someone called Stuart Hall that people were talking about. This figurative Stuart Hall that existed beyond him, that was never securely within his control, seemed to require some explanation, or anyway, some narrative location. From a certain point in his career, as we know, he was forever recounting for others part of the story of himself in Britain. Those parts that had to do, for example, with the historic making of the first new left, or with cultural studies, or with the movement of Thatcherism. But Stuart also perceived a deeper, more complicated story to be told. The story that involved an enigma of departure as much as an enigma of arrival. The story, that is to say, of Jamaica. In short, Stuart found that he too had to reconstruct the story of Stuart Hall. And this is the story he, he tells in characteristic fashion in Familiar Stranger. As with everything he wrote, this reconstruction became really an exploration, a way less of writing autobiography, strictly speaking, than of clarifying, first of all, to himself the constituent elements of the long journey he had made to where and who he was. It became a way of learning something about himself, in other words, something he already knew in some inchoate form, but could now encounter from another point of view. And part of what he discovered about himself and tried to articulate was that his life had a shape that belonged not merely to himself, but to the modern world that is the colonial story of Jamaica. Note two. As I say, Stuart Hall was a singular intellectual. He inhabited the world in his own way with an, with an unmistakable presence. What we miss when we miss him is that his presence, erudite, inclusive, tempered, generous, what made him distinctive as an intellectual, I believe, and I've been saying this for a while and he's central to Stuart Hall's voice, is less the substantive content of the subject matter of his thought than the content of the form of his ever unfinished thinking. As everybody knows, Stuart was an intellectual of wide and multiple preoccupations. He staked a voracious <laughs> claim in many deba debates from Marxism to media, to popular culture, to the visual arts. And in each of these debates, what he added to them, or how he changed them, has become an indispensable aspect of his legacy. But Stuart was more than the sum total of his separate or interconnected contributions to the intellectual history of our time. He was much more than the sum total of his many ideas. Who he was as an intellectual, in other words, exceeded his celebrated views on Thatcher, say, or on the end of the essential black subject. Indeed, these views are what they are because of who he was, not the other way around. In other words, he, he was who he was as an intellectual by dint of his style. For Stuart, I believe, style defined the content of the form of his thinking acting being. It was not merely a contingent aspect of that thinking acting being, it was constitutive of it. What characterized Stuart was a certain sensibility, a certain attunement, a certain texture of understanding, by which I mean a certain way of coming at the world, the gestalt of an existential attitude that was the style of his habitus. And if we had to give a covering name to this style, and attitude, it would be a sense of displacement. Here, perhaps, is the center of what I want to get at. Fundamental to Stuart Hall's experience of himself in the world was his sense of displacement. This is a word that he constantly used in talking about himself. It's all over the text of Familiar Stranger. 
Stuart lived in and through displacement in all its ramifying resonances and implications, including, importantly, the psychic ones. Stuart was fully aware of the psychoanalytic provenance of displacement as a technical term that Freud used in talking about dream work in particular, the way the unconscious lives in the world through substitutions, condensations, postponements, and other decentering mediations. In any case, a good deal of Stuart's moral psychological sensibility can be thought of in terms of this to him founding sense of, him, of himself as being in the phrase he liked to borrow from Edward Said, out of place. It captured almost everything about him. Stuart understood himself to be constitutively and forever out of place. And much of his genius consists of the way in which he learned to use this sense of displacement of not quite corresponding to a presumed norm of self and society as a kind of hermeneutic lens through which to approach and critique the world. For Stuart, thinking depended on non-identity of the subject and the object. It was the discrepancy, the difference, the non-correspondence between the Stuart of his own experience and the figure, the Stuart, that would, be, that would become the possibility for his thinking. Notice then how thinking for Stuart was not a self-evident activity, but a mediated labor of creative displacement, and how his own experience of himself could become the ground of his hermeneutic understanding. He didn't know this automatically. It wasn't a transparent fact given to him by the world. It was a fact he had to earn by learning it. And what he learned to do was to think through the unnamed Jamaican in himself in such a way as to render that experience a tacit form of universality. What he learned gradually to do was to make his experience of displacement the implicit and explicit ground of his relation to theoretical understanding. He did this, of course, not so much by writing deeply or extensively about Jamaica, which he didn't do, but by writing out of the social historical fissures and moral psychological textures that provided the background of his fundamental experience of himself. Note three. How might we think of the sources of this ground of displacement? Stuart's familial and social origins in the Jamaican brown middle class are, I believe, the founding location for the emergence of this experience of displacement, at least in a latent form. Stuart's parents, Herman and Jesse Hall, belonged to a distinct fragment of this class. I won't go into the sociological details here. Suffice it to say that they seem to have embodied the familiar ethos and values of the brown middle class and to have produced for Stuart at their meticulously organized home on Trevenian Park Road, the subtle and not so subtle appurtenances of brown middle class life. It is in this context that, in a pre-theoretical way, he comes to embody displacement as a kind of primary experience, that displacement comes to acquire the quality of second nature that informed the given tendency of dispositions, a habitus, and that would become the implicit background resource for his later more self-consciously reflective or theoretical ideas. Because again, note that in my view, for Stuart, displacement was first and foremost not a theory, but a sense of the world. Lest the way, lest the way he self-consciously came to the world than the founding way in which the world came to him in the form of intelligibility. Now, the Jamaican brown middle class is a peculiar social, psychological, and historical formation. It is a formation, I believe, that we have not critically thought about sufficiently in either fictive or non-fictive work. Still, in my view anyway, given its singularly contradictory role in the making of modern Jamaica, it is a social formation that deserves far more critical attention than it has so far attracted. There is scarcely, there is surely, for example, a psychoanalytic story waiting to be written about the internal libidinal structuring of this formation, the way historically it has lived color and class and taste, 
and the way these touch on the most minute and intimate aspects of their social and personal and emotional existence. The defining social and affective experience of this middle class, its historical ontology, so to speak, is precisely displacement. That is, its tormented inability to be what it is, its inability to be in place, to find a restful home in its given identity. What is it about this middle class that encourages an originary experience of displacement? How might we think of this founding sense of displacement as coming to form the ground of a larger way of being in and thinking through the world? Speaking in an excessively shorthand and even reductive way for want of time here, the Jamaican brown middle class was historically born within and out of the social contradictions and sexual violations and depredations of colonial plantation slavery. In a certain very relevant sense, it was born already out of place, superfluous, and excrescence within a social economic order principally organized around a black-white racial binary. In this racial dynamic, the brown middle class belonged to neither one pole nor the other. Consequently, it lived in disavowal of any proximity with blackness, including the blackness within itself, and in aspiration of material and symbolic identification with whiteness. In a profound social, cultural, and psychological sense, neither this disavowal nor this aspiration were completely realized, completely realizable. And therefore, what defines the brown middle class is the way it has lived perpetually, unevenly, in an unresolvable tension or anxiety of belonging. As Stuart later recognized, born as he was in 1932, he grew up inside this brown middle class formation as it negotiated a period of unprecedented upheaval marked by the modernizing social and political revolution of 1938 to 1944. For this was a moment when the spontaneous revolt of black urban and rural working, of the black rural, and urban working class in effect pried open a political space in which the aspiring nationalist middle class could at last begin to mobilize a successful claim for its right to rule. This, to my mind, is the meaning of constitutional decolonization. But if this was a moment of tremendous possibility for advanced sections of the nationalist middle class, seeing before itself the luminous prospect of holding the reins of government, it was also a moment of threat and loss for another section that could only see the coming future as the looming ruin of the old Jamaica. Although we sometimes think of it this way as a consequence, no doubt, of the normalization of the nationalist narrative, historically, the brown middle class was never a homogeneous formation. Certainly in the 1940s, they were not all committed nationalists or not uniformly, unambiguously so. In other words, it shouldn't be surprising that whereas there were those who came to see themselves in the mirror of nationalism, there were, there were also those who looked to the future with a mixture, perhaps, of fear and resignation. Among these were Stuart's parents, Herman and Jesse. Stuart always said they were not like or imagined norm of the nationalist brown middle class, and this is what he meant. They never warmed to the ideology of self-determination. It's not clear they welcomed the adult suffrage constitution of 1944. Undoubtedly, for their fragment of the middle class, their familiar disavowal of blackness and aspiration to whiteness must only have been intensified by their increasing anachronism, their growing social and political irrelevance. In this context, one can only imagine how the rituals of brown middle class pretension and repression, the unreal realities of life at Trevenian Park Road, must have registered in a contradictory way on the, on the young Stuart. I say contradictory here because the paradox, as, we, as he would have been the first to point out, is that you had necessarily to be it in order to be able organically to recoil from it, as he did. You had already to embody the class color habitus into which you were installed in some form 
in order to live its pretensions and repressions in an equally organic, dissenting refusal. That is, not merely as ideology, but as a foundational decentering of identity inscribed in the primary experience of a divided self. Stuart's self-consciousness of his journey, indeed his self-consciousness of himself as a kind of itinerary, is the story of constantly navigating the trace, as he would say, of that original structure. Stuart was always preoccupied with the way in which an outside comes to be lived on or as the inside, the way that is to say large social historical processes are transmuted into lived experiences within a family, say, or how a social and political economy comes to be installed psychically in an individual's libidinal economy. As with everything he talked about, this relation between inside and outside was never perceived in a reductive way. The psyche, for example, was never a mere reflection of the social. Rather, what compelled him, as one version of the relation between the general and the particular, or the social and the individual, or the historical and the psychological, was the, was the contradictory, perhaps partly phantasmatic way a family comes to embody in a mediated or decentered or displaced way the social contradictions of a particular history, and how further a child comes to embody, again in a mediated or decentered or displaced way, in the domain and language of the Freudian unconscious, the layered burdens of both the social and the familiar. It is this experience of the brown middle class's alienation from itself, I believe, not merely its anti-popular or elitist character or cultural politics, but its moral psychological betrayal of something of itself, its destructive racial self-hatred that founds Stuart's constitutional sense of non-correspondence and of displacement. Again, my point, almost my whole point, is that part of what makes him the singular intellectual he became was, have, was to have been able to transmute this pre-theoretical habitus into a hermeneutic by which to conceptually understand the world. In other words, in my view, it is not the content of the theory of identity or diaspora, say, that bears consideration, but the sensibility that drew him to them, the attunement to the texture of a modern experience that solicits from him the demand for a theory of them. This is what makes Stuart so distinctive and intellectual. Note four. Finally, I want to talk a bit about Stuart in relation to the ethical life that I believe was implicit in his practice or his art of being an intellectual. By ethical life, I don't mean anything very abstract or abstruse, anything excessively Hegelian, say. I mean simply to evoke a background dimension to Stuart's way of carrying on his self-examined intellectual life, the temper and orientation of the values and virtues through which that life, as a life that cultivated human excellences, was actualized. I keep saying that what interests me about Stuart is not the content of his views so much as his way of having views, and indeed his way of changing his views. This is what I'm calling his style, and that style connoted and disclosed an ethics, an idiom of unformalized attitude, so to speak, that shaped his presence and his practice. I will try to connect this ethics to some of my description of his experience of being a Jamaican. As I have been saying, a particular primary experience of displacement lent to Stuart some of the basic elements out of which he developed his mature cultural political style and vocabulary, and also, therefore, the tacit idiom of his ethics. Or to put this another way, in the form of a question, how might one describe the sort of reflective consciousness disclosed in Stuart's work? It is self-evident, I think, that Stuart's was a profoundly reflective consciousness, that is, a consciousness that lived in a perpetually self-questioning way. But I do not think that it is enough to merely say that he was self-questioning in his mode of intellectual practice, because there is undoubtedly more than one way of being reflectively self-conscious. 
One way I have been trying to describe Stuart's distinctive mode of, reflecting, of reflective being, his self-conscious way of being the intellectual he sought to be, is by thinking of him as a listening self. That's what I tried to develop in that book, Stuart, as a listening self. <coughs> I won't return to that discussion here, but I want to focus on another dimension of Stuart's ethical mode of intellectual life, one concerned with his curious capacity for self-constitution and self-revision. In an admittedly exploratory way, I want, to, I want to layer the idea of a listening self with that of an ironic one. Now, I want it to be clear that I'm not using ironic here in the conventional sense to suggest something merely linguistic, namely saying one thing while meaning another. So I'm not using it, for example, as a species of mocking or derisive speech. I am using it in the way that some recent work has suggested to point to a certain practice or art of living, one specifically that cultivates a readiness for disruption and revision, or if you like, of displacement. An ironic self may be a self that experiences itself as never quite corresponding with itself. It is a self that lives with an acute sense of, of its own historicity. An ironic self is attuned not only to the world as change, but to itself as changeful. It acknowledges the uses of stepping back, but not all the way to nowhere. It practices not an abstracted detachment from the world, or from itself, but on the contrary, a passionate commitment to receptively relating to both. Let me give you just one example of what I'm getting at, a familiar one that Stuart talked about in various of his writings, though not exactly in this way. It concerned the antinomies of his own constitution and self-constitution of identity, and it is profoundly marked by the illuminable trace of Jamaica. Remember that when Accompanied by his implacable mother, Stuart arrived in England in 1951 to take up his roads. He was, by his own account, a bright young man with an urging, if still in Kuwait, political consciousness and a longing for the modern. This arrival coincidentally converges with the arrival of thousands of West Indians, as Oki alluded to early, earlier, West Indian migrants, large numbers of them Jamaica, who are not, by the prevailing norms, like Stuart in class or color or education, but with whom he begins to form an uncertain sense, partly conscious, partly not, of identification, even post Notting Hill in 1958 of solidarity. On one of his trips to Jamaica in the early 1960s, his mother says to him that she hopes the English don't mistake him for an immigrant, that is, one of those black working class West Indians he'd seen chaotically streaming out of Paddington Station. It is a radical or rupturing moment of self-deconstitution and self-reconstitution. Stuart instantly recognizes in his mother's remark the perverse machinations of brown middle class racism, the neurotic disavowals through which she seeks to reinstall him into the hege hegemonic place of his social origins. And not only does he recoil from its unavoidable psychological impact, but in the same moment he finds in it the reflective ground for renaming his sense of displacement and animating it, moreover, with cultural political content. He, too, is an immigrant. But almost as soon as this moment of decentering has acquired a usable vocabulary and a plausible affective salience, almost as soon as he has gotten the hang, so to speak, of being an immigrant, he's once again unexpectedly decentered, thrown off balance by a new set of forces. A new generation, including his own children, largely born in Britain, who are influenced by the militancy of Rastafari and black power, and who see themselves not in the demeanor of the supplicant immigrant, but as black with an assertive claim to make on the British state and British society. A new cultural political language is emerging. It is emerging in a different way in Jamaica too at the same moment. And it is for Stuart another rupturing moment of self-deconstitution and self-reconstitution 
another intimate moment of uncanny and ironic disruption when he is faced with the unstable historicity of who he is, when he can no longer simply go on occupying the old identity immigrant because he too is black. He discovers, recovers, as he puts it. And he must now confront the implications for himself, both personal and political, of getting the hang of being black, of recovering, discovering the idiom of a black identity. Now, the point I'm making in, reco in recounting this example, its content notwithstanding, is less that Stuart, Stuart eventually grew to think of himself as black, or even that, as a way of theorizing the process, he invented the idea of the, of the end of the essential black subject, both important in themselves, but that it is an instance of the ethics of his art of living in displacement. It is an instance of his unerring capacity in shifting conjunctures, to self-consciously take stock of himself, to experience an upheaval of identity in himself, and to be able to respond receptively and creatively to the demands embodied in the crisis. It is an example, I believe, of the kind of reflective consciousness that he sought to educate in himself and encourage in others as a way of, he would put it, living with difference. The difference within himself and the difference within oneself and between oneself and others. And therefore, it is an instance of the kind of sensibility that registered his responsiveness to the idea that human identity is never transparent, never a simple, seamlessly self evident totality, but lived in often multiply mediated iterations of division and self division. In other words, that displacement and non-correspondence are integral, are integral aspects of human forms of life. And further, it is an example that crucially grows out of his own primary experience of displacement and non-correspondence, and, non and out of his reflective consciousness of his constitution within a specific, that is, Jamaican form of that idiom. Thank you, David, for the very eloquent and evocative um, exploration of these themes and Stuart's constitution of himself. Um, as somebody who knew Stuart quite well, it's rather as if through your words you're conjuring them up before us. So, very moving, I think. Um, we'll now pass on to uh, Michael Dash's um, presentation. Michael Dash, born in Trinidad, um, has worked extensively on Haitian literature and French Caribbean writers, especially Edouard Bisson, whom he's going to talk about today. Um, <clears throat> and he's translated um, several of Bisson's important works, The Ripening, 1985, Caribbean Discourse, 1989, which I was um, rereading the amazing introduction he did, which I still think is a a brilliant introduction to um, Glisson's themes. Monsieur Toussaint in 2005. He spent um, more than 20 years at the University of West Indies, Jamaica, where he was professor of Francophone literature and chair of modern languages, and subsequently moved to New York, to New York University, where he's professor of French, having been the director of the Africana Studies program, also at NYU. And his own publications include Literature and Ideology in Haiti, Haiti in the United States, both 81 and 88, Edouard Lisson, 95, and The Other America, Caribbean Literature in a New World Context in 1998. So, Michael. So, thanks so much for inviting me. As I was telling Okui, when I, when I got his email, I was wondering whether it was a hoax. Um, because I, I don't speak at museums. As you can see from the, the list of publications, I write about literature. Um, however, you don't work on Edouard Glissant without having to spill over into all kinds of other areas. And uh, um, this is the second time I'm now speaking at a museum. The first time actually was at MoMA, which was the first invitation. So it then occurred to me that um, <coughs> I have another career <laughs> Explaining Edouard Glissant 
to curators. <laughs> so, and, so thank you very much for inviting me. Um, Okui and Andrea, who was terrific in organizing everything. So this, uh, today's uh, presentation is called Livresse du Sensible, Reading Surfaces with Edouard Glissant. Um, I kept the French because it is, just sounds so good. If I were to translate this into English, <laughs> it's really the intoxication of the tactile. You know, it, there's something there, but it doesn't sound like Livresse du Sensible. And if you know your Foucault, that's where it comes from. It's not me. It's uh, Michel Foucault's Histoire de la Folie. So um, what I'm going to try to do is um, explain the way in which uh, a certain idea of Caribbean art emerges and probably still holds true today. And Okui almost stole my thunder by saying something about world, worldliness, and subject, which, in fact, is where eventually this um, presentation is going to go. So <laughs> um, we'll begin with the this first idea of Caribbean art, which, in fact, is slowly and um, subtly contested by Glissant. So you get another way of looking at Caribbean art, and I suspect that this is really pertinent to Bowling's work. So during a two-month stay in Haiti in 1945, André Breton was struck by a painting by Hector Hippolyte hanging in the Centre d'Art in Port-au-Prince. Let me see if I can get this painting up. Oh, so here it is. Breton, perhaps because of his atheist beliefs, seemed unaware of the painting subject, the crowning of the Virgin Mary by 14 angels. Nor was he interested in the decorative aspects of Hippolyte's work, knowing that the latter, Hippolyte, painted the facades of various buildings for a living. For Breton, the painting, and I'm quoting Breton now, evoked the same sensations as a beautiful day, a beautiful sunny day in the country, gently waving grass, keep looking at that painting, sprouting seeds, buttercups, the iridescence of, in, of insects' wings, the tiny clashing symbols of flowering creepers, the clusters of fruit juggled by the season's hands. Furthermore, Hippolyte, but all claims, had a message to communicate. He was the guardian of a secret. Breton had no way of knowing whether Hippolyte did, in fact, harbor secrets. His knowledge of Creole was non-existent, and he had never even gone to the painter's umfo, or temple. Aligning possession in Haitian voodoo with what he called primitive thought, Breton saw Hippolyte as a medium in whose paintings of Vodou spirits, he could find traces of esoteric practices. In Hippolyte's painting of Ogun, in Hippolyte's painting of Ogun, which Breton actually owned, he concludes that, I quote Breton again, it is immediately apparent that the representation of Ogun Ferrai is closely akin to that of the juggler in the tarot pack. What Breton projected onto Hippolyte was his own increasing interest in the esoteric and the occult. In a 1948 interview with Aimé Patry, he claimed to be convinced of the importance of primal forces to the survival of threatened communities, and I quote, to a great extent, they thereby resist secular oppression. In parentheses, I think of the Hopi Indians, and as well, as well as extreme economic privation, I think of black Haitians. What particularly concerns us in this view of the painter as an outsider visionary, what, what can, can, particularly concerns us is this view of the painter as an outsider visionary with a secret. Not surprisingly, 
Breton's essay on Hippolyte in Surrealism and Painting is placed just before his text on the art of the insane. What, what is the origin of the idea of the artist as an outsider visionary? We have tended to see, to see surrealism as a literary movement to which visual art was merely an adjunct. But for our purposes, it's more useful to see how the literary influenced the theorizing of the visual and how surrealist art came to be seen as a poetic language. We can see how the poetic and the visual would become intimately linked for Breton through his use of the literary term lyricism in an article he wrote in 1927 entitled Surrealisme et Peinture. Breton declared, I'm quoting, lyricism, which is what recommends to us every work we admire, is not by its nature an indefinable property. Lyricism, conceived as the expression of a primal human utterance, is picked up by Breton as a defining feature of visual art. And indeed, in this regard, the painter is considered privileged since verbal language was an inferior way of communicating primal utterance. For instance, what Breton thought he saw in Hippolyte was a concrete, material realization of primal utterance. The pervasiveness of this ideal of extreme states of feeling in the making of art is arguably present as much in Breton's appreciation of Hector Hippolyte as it is in Aimé Césaire's enthusiastic appreciation of the paintings of Wilfredo Lam. So here's Césaire and Lam. Césaire had also met Lam in the 1940s. Césaire is by no means, of course, interested in the occult. But what he saw in Lam as the ideal Caribbean artist that Lam was exemplary outsider visionary. Lam's lyricism is not about esoteric symbols, but it gives him access to a primal Afro-Caribbean unconscious. For Césaire, Lam performs a kind of aesthetic marronage through his ability to give material form to verbal delirium. And this is Césaire writing about Lam and Lamb's paintings. Through Lamb's efforts, the absurd, ready-made, unyielding, uninspired forms that have blocked the way are blasted apart by solar dynamite. Through Lamb's efforts, form becomes malleable, thus legitimate. Through Lamb's efforts, the primordial spirit, I mean feeling, dream, heredity, can be projected as hallucination. Wilfredo Lam keeps magnificently the great and terrible rendezvous with the forest, the swamp, the monster, the night, the seeds that fly, the rain, the liana, the epiphyte, the snake, fear, leaping, life, end of quote. Here the visual artist realizes the desired goal of the, tr the goal of the true, the desired goal for true poetic activity for Césaire. That is, the plunge into the depths of memory and the emancipations of forms and images that surpass lived experience. This model of the intense and uncontrolled emotion as the source of the modern work of art suited Césaire's introspective existential quest for self in the 30s and 40s. Nevertheless, it was not the only approach to artistic creation. It was opposed in the interwar, interwar years by a counter model, mostly inspired by Cubist collage. In contrast to the surrealist concept of extreme lyrical subjectivity, the French poet Pierre Reverdy, whose ideas would have an enormous impact on Edouard Glissant, 
insisted on the material and grounded nature of art production. The objective of artistic creation was not to articulate primal utterance, but to create new relations between impenetrable opacities. In Reverdy's words, art was to, I quote, break the connections that things have with each other. Painters have always applied this means to objects, and instead of representing them, they use the connections they discovered between them. Much later, in order to describe Riverdi's materialist aesthetic, Glissant labeled him, I quote, a visionary of the concrete. While Glissant's essay on Riverdi While Glissant's essay on Riverdi in the tellingly named book of essays, L'Intention Poétique, The Poetic Intention, which is really about intentionality, goes to the heart of the debate. So indeed, Glissant's essay on Riverdi goes to the heart on, of the debate on lyricism as opposed to materialism. Glissant writes, I quote, neither realist nor mystic since here you can, be a, you can be a visionary without being a mystic, Reverdi is a purveyor of the concrete. Emotional effusion is, a, a, is replaced, in Glissant's view, by asceticism. And he furthermore declares Reverdi an, an ascetic of the concrete. Glissant's attachment to Reverdi's materialist aesthetics become even more logical when we take into account that other visionary of the concrete for whom he had, he had the highest praise, Victor Sigalev. I think I'm gonna have to steal some water. Uh, Victor Sigalev. Victor Sigalev was a medical doctor who traveled at the end of the 19th, early 20th century in the Far East, China, places like that. And he wrote an unfinished book called uh, Sul Exotisme on Exoticism. Um, in Segalen's unfinished 1904 essay on exoticism, he's obsessed by what he sees as the degradation of the world's diversity by the spread of westernization. For Segalen, the ap apocalyptic threat of sameness from the unstoppable damage of colonialism and tourism would destroy the profound heterogeneity of the world. In these notes, because it's not really a book, he is temporarily, temporarily reassured by science's discovery at the time of irreducible atomic particles. This new approach to matter, he writes, I quote, delights me with the answer it gives me. It instructs me about the discontinuous nature of the world. It teaches me that the world's structure is infinitely granular. And the French is granuleuse, the word that he's using. It's a granular world. Segalen is delighted because of the irreducible materiality of the granular. Um, because the irreducible material, materiality of the granular negates simplification and synthesis and privileges speci specificity, diversity, opacity. The intensity of emotional, exp of emotional experience for Segalen derives from coming into contact with the concrete specificity of matter. The title of this presentation is derived from this idea of a salutary shock that is experienced when opacity and multiplicity of matter are revealed. Michel Foucault, in his discussion of Diderot's Le Nouveau de Rameau, Rameau's nephew, in History of Madness, argues that unreason, because it de raison, allows us access to the world's granular materiality. And I quote from the translation, the experience of Ramos' nephew already demonstrated all that it contains of the drunkenness of the sensible. That's the other translation for uh, livres du sensible. 
the fascination of the immediate and the painful irony where the solitude of delirium originates. Rejection of totalizing reductive theories for an embrace of the granular, of the granular surface multiplicity of the world and the attendant vision of a post-colonial order of non-hierarchical proliferation is probably the central pillar of Glissant's poetics. In the 1950s, In the 1950s, Glissant struggled with the tendency of language to reduce and contain concrete specificity and the need to find a way of communing the tactile sensation of the world's materiality. This short anecdote from the poetic intention, l'intention poétique, is very instructive. Glissant says, let me try clumsily to draw a tree. I will end up with a mass of vegetation where only the sky of the page will terminate the indeterminate growth. End of quote. The concrete fullness of the object cannot be contained by the page which must yield to the accumulating multiplicity of the real. We can contrast Breton's view of Hippolyte with Glissant's, as Glissant is far more concerned with excess, multiplicity, and repetition. <laughs> Glissant would not only have seen the 14 angels, he would have counted them. Breton doesn't even see the angels. His approach to Haitian painting, in fact, avoided the esoteric and the primal to stress its hieroglyphic capacity to directly express the real. And these are some of the comments he made about Haitian, the origins, in fact, of Haitian painting. He says, it is created on the earth with natural product, products, starch, flower, indigo, on perishable material. That is a form of painting that produces a schematic version of reality, the beginning of all pictography. There's an interesting connection here between some of Segalen's interest in Chinese characters um, and what Lisa is saying, because um, Sigaland felt that our alphabet simply turned things into abstractions, whereas a, 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 a more pictographic al alphabet would contain much more of the real and the material. Reinstating art's direct contact with con concrete materiality is also the point of an anecdote related in Caribbean discourse, where Glissant describes a visit to Martinique by the Cuban sculptor Augustin Cardenas. During his stay there, Cardenas asks for a piece of mahogany uh, from the Martinican hillside to create a piece of sculpture. But as Glissant put it, the overseas department of Martinique, French since, uh, was it 1735? <laughs> lacks massive trees, lacks a hinterland, lacks, and the word he uses was épaisseur, lacks thickness. Its emblem is a meager stalk of sugar cane. So they bring this piece of wood to Cardenas. Cardenas is first put off by the slender piece of wood which was brought to him from the Martinican hillside, but the tactile sensation, the grainy feel of the mahogany leads to work, which is, Glissant says, the poetic equivalent of Martinican space. It's sideways there, but that's what he produces. Glissant says, Cardenas' hands did not resist the hard, 
brown maho ma mahogany for long. And there soon emerged the undeniable figure of an ancestor who is broken in silence. In it, the flatness of the original wood becomes patience and transparency. The tiny opening became the eye of lineage and lost time took shape in our consciousness. Cardenas is not an outsider visionary. He neither projects himself onto the natural world, nor is he the medium for what primal forces may be hidden therein. The sculptor's hand restores the island's ambiguity, its mystery, and fleetingly, Martinique can escape its status as a French department and project its opacity into a world of primal matter. This is ultimately a powerful, destabilizing political gesture. The political implications of Cardenas's mysterious object are made clearer in a 1982 essay by Glisson on Wifredo Lam, which is called Lam, L'Envol et la Réunion. Lam, flight and uh, encounter. Glisson presents Lam as a painter of proliferating opacity who audaciously spreads across the campus, and this is the painting, who audaciously spreads across the campus, I quote, a vertical profusion which bursts out of memory and explodes jungle-like in insular space. The accumulation of signs is spread on the campus's surface, blurring the difference between material and transcendental. Glissant continues, the primordial jungle empties into winged flight. This marks our splendid emergence into the world. The space of works like L'Envol et la Réunion does not plunge into depths. Its intent is to accumulate signs. For these works, the dimensions of the real the rehabilitated forms of the African universe spray outwards in all directions and complete themselves, that is, become real in the un unpredictability, unpredictability of vast global relationality." End of quote. The fulfillment of the dense palpable specificity of the primordial disseminated in the unpredictable expansiveness of global space, points to a politics, points beyond, sorry, a politics of native return to an allegory of creolization. Glissant's theorizing of the expressive surface of the canvas and its ability to convey through intense modes of sensation new political possibilities is further developed in his uh, uh, description of the paintings of Roberto Mata. He had, he had seen Mata's paintings in, um, in post-war Paris. In the Chilean painter's work, rationality and recognition are suspended as we are released from grounded identity. I quote, in Matter's canvas, the eye no, no longer explored space. Space entered into thought. No, it invaded it and shaped it at the same time. Matter's fierce drive to, matter's fierce drive to signify space, that is also thought. The painter's work does not reproduce pre-existing forms, but renders visible a world of invisible forces that we can poetically inhabit. And here are some of the paintings that Glissant is referring to. This was called La Luce in Dolor, Painless Light. Morphology, psychological morphology. And this one is the forest. The painter, 
I quote Lisa again, wishes from the outset to offer states of consciousness not to be beheld, but to be experienced, and not in their relation to a graphic system, but metamorphosed into lines and forces, colors and flashes. He does not use preconceived forms nor symbolic representations. He struggles to create a graphic language from the chaos and tension of the world. Without ever altering the means, the painting transcends its narrow plastic circumstances and is charged with signification, with the very force of matter. Profusion of exploded signs that never settle into a system. Matter's paintings herald the advent of what Lisa would call the New World Baroque. Uh, Lisa again, the shudder of the Baroque aims to signify that all knowledge is yet to come, which is its real value. Similarly, techniques of the Baroque will favor extension over depth. End of quote. Matter's paintings were called open lands, terre ouverte, by Glissant. And they are read as allegories of the experience of uprooting, errancy, and the encounter with alterity of what Glissant called the throne subject, l'être jeté, the Atlantic African who is plunged into modernity. The opaque, chaotic surface, which defies comprehension, the embrace of unknowability, the work whose only access is through l'ivresse du sensible, is the path of knowing for the deportee, stripped of everything, the naked migrant of the Black Atlantic. Thank you.